Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar where we are going to be looking at resistance today. Uh, we'll just do a few bit of introductions before uh, we get started, just so everyone can get sort of settled in and there's still some more people joining. So today we're going to talk about different types of resistance, uh, what it looks like and how we best sort of manage it within the industry. Um, and we'll go through uh, a few other bits as well, which uh, I'm sure we'll get to. It is great to see a couple of uh, 250 plus people joining us today. Just a heads up on next month, I'll be back on the 3rd of November, um, where we will have a webinar on proofing strategies. So don't miss that one. PPC Live is coming back to Harrogate on the 22nd of March, 2023. Um, it is a fantastic lineup of exhibitors. Uh, there will be some talks there and demonstrations, uh, and there'll be opportunities for you to get some hand-on experience uh, with some new pieces of equipment uh, that is being exhibited at the show as well. You can register online. It is now live. If you just uh, search for PPC Live 2023, um, and you'll be able to find all the information on the day there, and it will also have the registration form at the bottom as well. Um, we have added lots of member benefits this year uh, from discounts on things like TradePoint, the Dell computers and accessories, right the way through to business support in marketing and communications. Uh, again, you can find these on the BPSA website if you just look under the uh, membership tab um, and you'll see all the membership benefits in there. There is one point available for today's webinar. If you are watching this live, this will be added automatically because you'll just fill the registration form at the start. If you are watching this um, on YouTube or one of the social platforms uh, after it's been recorded, you'll need to add that point yourself. Um, just go to your relevant scheme and add the points. There is a chat section, which is great to see some of you already using that. Um, again, talk amongst yourselves in that chat section. Uh, and you can also, if you have any technical issues, um, there's a team in the background that will uh, be able to help you with that. Um, uh, check the Q&A section. Uh, so there is a Q&A section. If you have any questions during today, uh, drop them in the Q&A section. If we get time at the end, I'll hopefully be able to get through some of those. Um, if you do have any technical issues, uh, you know, put that to the team. They may be able to help you. Some of the times it's just a case of turning it off and then turning it back on again, uh, and that should hopefully work. Uh, this year's charity is uh, Dementia UK. And if you can donate towards a charity, that would be amazing as well. Okay, that's that then, bit's done. Okay, so today we're going to be looking mainly at physiological and behavioral resistance in rats and mice. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into sort of the genetic mutation side of the resistance, um, but more towards the understanding uh, of what to look for, um, understanding the codes that are out there and used commonly, and also what we can do about it um, as well. <clears throat> uh, there are a few different sources of information now around physiological resistance. Um, and where I can, uh, I'll sort of signpost you towards them and um, the different groups and organizations. Uh, and it's really good to keep up to date as it is being updated on a regular basis. Um, and if you're interested in sort of resistant strains in your area, these are the sort of places you'll be able to find that information as well. Oh. So the agenda for today, we're going to mainly talk about the two main ones that come across uh, for ourselves, that's the physiological resistance. We're going to look at what physiological resistance is. We're going to talk a bit about tail sampling and how that works. We're going to look at a bit about the resistance history uh, and where it sort of came from, and then manage resistance in your area. We'll then touch on a bit about behavioral resistance, so a bit about what behavioral resistance is, and then sort of managing that as well. Okay, so we're mainly going to be talking about two species of rodents today. That's the house mouse and the brown rat. These are obviously our commensal rodents. So it basically means they um, rely on us to survive. They feed off man's plate. Uh, so they use us for food source um, uh, and um, water and a, a source of uh, arborage as well. Um, so these are the two, two main species we're going to talk about today. Okay, so there are four types of resistance. There are more, but these are sort of four that fall into what we do. Um, and we're going to talk about two of those today. You've got metabolic resistance. Now, this is uh, an enzyme, the P450 enzyme. Um, and this breaks down the active ingredient before it has time to take an effect. So this group of enzymes are normally classed as super proteins. 
And it's what's used to metabolize drugs and toxins within the liver and the intestine. Uh, this is sometimes, um, it's not been looked into into too much detail as of yet. Uh, there are lots of information on um, you know, this enzyme within people and other animals, uh, but there's still a little bit more work to do within rodents. So there's not a lot of information out there, um, but it is something that has been looked into. I think it's the French researchers that have started to look into this um, and they've been able to identify where metabolic resistance is and with which strains. So that's something to look out for. Then we're going to talk about the two main ones that we come across. That's behavioral resistance and genetic or physiological resistance. Now, behavioral resistance is where rodents in a population have built up an avoidance to bait um, or the materials. Uh, so they'll actually just avoid sort of bait boxes, traps, um, trays, things like that. Uh, and I have got a few studies that sort of highlight how this has been um, picked up and what to look out for. We're going to talk about genetic resistance. Um, now, this is believed to have been around for a long time, uh, you know, before rodenticides were developed, um, but it's been passed down through the parent. So it's a mutation that's passed down in the DNA um, to the offspring, and it just stops rodenticides working as they should do. And we will look a bit more into this as we go through it. And then you've got natural resistance. Uh, this means that rodents are naturally less susceptible um, and brown rats, uh, sorry, uh, house mice uh, have a higher level of this natural resistance. So they need to eat more bait on a pound for pound weight basis. Um, and that's just naturally uh, something that uh, mice have, house mice have. Um, and this resistance is not singular in population. So you can find population of rodents that have one or more resistant traits. And with genetic resistance, there are different levels of susceptibility. And this can be found in different populations, um, which I will touch on. So I guess, why do we have resistance? Really, there's two main reasons why resistance uh, was around in the first place. Um, the first one being we've had very few active ingredients. Uh, these have had many legal restrictions. So things like single use, uh, single feed baits at one point were banned from external use, which obviously uh, created a few problems. Um, so we've had very few baits with lots of legal restrictions. And also in the early days, especially, um, it was found there was a lot of poor practice. So things like not following product labels, not using the product correctly, or not fully eliminating the infestation. So they've managed to control the ones that are susceptible, but have left the ones that are resistant. Um, and then this just obviously creates a, a further problem. And just by leaving a small number of resistant rodents could mean that the next population, there may be a higher level of resistance in that area um, when the population sort of uh, regroups again. Okay, so genetic resistance, and this is what we're going to look at first. This is basically um, uh, rodents have an ability to survive what would normally be a lethal dose of anticoagulant. As I mentioned earlier, it's a mutation uh, that is identified in the DNA, and I'll talk about where it actually comes from, the mutation. Um, and it's passed down from the parents to the siblings. Now, it's like this has been around for a long time, um, and we will go into the history and how it planned out now. So, strychnine was first used in around the 16th century. Um, zinc phosphates were then registered in around 1940s, and warfarin then came around in around 1948. Uh, moving on from there, resistance was first found in Scotland in 1959. So, anticoagulant rodenticides first started to be developed in the early 1940s into the 1950s. Um, and this helped overcome the issues faced with earlier acute poisons, which had pretty much been deemed useless by this point. So they had to come up with something new, which is why uh, they come up with these um, rodenticide in the 1940s, 1950s. Now, these new chronic rodenticide means that treatment started to become effective. And then populations of rodents that they couldn't control with earlier products, uh, it was now possible to start controlling them using these new, new, uh, new rodenticides. So the f guards came first, the first generation anticoagulants with warfarin, obviously uh, coming into circulation in 1948. And then soon after that, um, within a few years, cumatechanol uh, was also on the market. Um, and it, it was uh, a, a multi-feed bait, but with a multi-feed, they could take a lethal dose within that first sort of 24 hours. So their, uh, the rate of how long it would take them to succumb to it was still around four to 10 days. Um, which is similar to what we have uh, these days as well with uh, the second generations. Now, detection to resistance of first generation anticoagulants was found in 1958, and that was uh, found on a pig farm up in Scotland. And by 1962, it had pretty much been confirmed through field trials and lab tests 
um, that there was a resistance uh, in areas uh, to all first generation anticoagulants. So it didn't take long. It was only a few years from being brought to market to actually finding out there was resistance to these products. Um, and a lot of this, like I said, was due to poor practice uh, and just not dealing with their infestations properly uh, in the early days. During the 1960s, um, again, resistance was found in other areas such as Wales, Sussex and Kent and then Hampshire, which we know nowadays is uh, you know, the, the most problem area of the country, um, which I will cover. And then there's some, the story somewhat repeats itself um, in the 1970s and 80s when second generation anticoagulants, so dif di difenicum and bromodialone, um, when these came to the market in the 1970s, 1980s, within a few years, uh, there was resistance found to these products. Um, and that was in sort of East Anglia, Yorkshire and Lincolnshire areas. Now, it's at this point uh, that single feeds were then developed. And that sort of brings us up to this uh, modern day period where we have the products that we have now um, with the legal restrictions that come on the product label with them. Okay, so this is the VKORC1 enzyme. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this. I just wanted to show where the codes came from um, as to what we use nowadays when we talk about uh, resistance. So this enzyme is basically a string of beads. There's 163 of them. You can see every so often along the beads, there is a number. So there's 163 of them. Uh, and where it's in a green tube, that is where it actually has an effect. So that's the redox center where it actually has an effect uh, on, in our case, the vitamin K cycle. So it's amino acid. Each one of these beads is an amino acid, and you can see it is given a letter. Um, so if we take the Hampshire strain, which is 120 down here, which is the L, um, that would stand for leucine. So each, each um, amino acid uh, has a name to it, uh, and that le letter corresponds with a name. With the Scotland strain, that mutation was found in 128, which is that L in the third tube, uh, bottom left-hand corner. And then the Wales, Yorkshire, and Kent strain, the change actually happened in 139, uh, which is a little bit further up that same tube. Now, this amino acid mutated in something different, uh, which prevented the rodenticides that we have from working properly. Like I say, it was believed that this happened many years before we had rodenticides. It's just been uh, become a problem because the use of rodenticides um, has highlighted this resistance. Okay, so this is what it looks like on paper. So then codes, you can see there is the full name um, and then the abbreviation. Uh, and this is what you'll see when you're looking at resistance mapping. Um, or if you're looking at resistance information, they normally have these codes on them. So let's take Scotland, for instance. Uh, the amino acid was leucine. The switch happened at cell number 128, and that mutated into a, a, a glutamine. So that's what happened. That's, that single mutation is what caused the, the, the resistance, or is what is, has brought upon, upon this resistance. Now, I know the letters don't match. Um, L was quite good because they still had an L, but when they got to G, uh, apparently G was already taken, so they named it a Q instead, which is why these abbreviations uh, are about. Um, and this is, like I say, what you're going to see on the resistance mapping. Now, the last one to be found was the Yorkshire strain. This wasn't just found in Yorkshire. It has been found in a lot of other areas, but uh, where they were first found is where it was given its name. So Scotland, it was first found in Scotland. Um, but these strains are now being found in more areas around the country. So the Hampshire strain has actually been found um, as far north as Scotland. They don't know how it's got there, um, but it has. I think it's because as um, populations meet, uh, there is then that breeding between the two um, parents that carry different mutations. Okay, I'm sure we've all seen this chart before, uh, and I think it's a really good way to demonstrate um, the anticoagulant active substance and their effectiveness depending on which mutation you have. So a red box basically means that the active substance um, should not be used against that strain, and a green, bo green box means that there should be relatively good success rate using that product. Um, orange is a bit sort of in between. You just need to be mindful that in them areas, uh, with these strains, sorry, um, you may have some sort of uh, resistance there, or it may take um, you know, a, a different path on uh, how that product will work. 
So you can see uh, across the resistant strains, warfarin and cumatechanol are all in red. So if you've got these resistant strains in your area, them two uh, F guards are not going to be uh, useful. And then with the Hampshire strain, you can see there is resistance there to diphenacum and bromodialone. Um, there are some levels of resistance to bromodialone in the Welsh border strain, and then diphenacum and bromodialone in the Yorkshire and Kent strains as well. Now, this is just the resistant strains. There have been a good number of samples that have shown full susceptible rodents from these areas. Um, it's somewhere about a third of the samples that are tested were susceptible rodents, um, and with two thirds of them carrying one of these mutations. So that's the overall picture of the testing. Um, now, it's not the same for all areas of the country. So if you take Hampshire, for instance, um, there are less susceptible rodents in Hampshire than there may be in other parts of the country. But out of the whole testing, about a third of them were found to be susceptible. Um, but the levels of resistant rodents in an area of the country may be slightly different. Just remember that um, when you're looking at the resistance mapping, that it may be a bit more sp uh, spread out. Okay, so resistance in mice then. Um, there's only been about 100 to 150 mice tail samples uh, that have been tested. And 44 of these were done in a, a bit of a project that was carried out in London. So it is an area that a lot more sampling um, needs to be done to get a better picture of the overall situation. Um, now these two codes are the important two mutation codes for resistant strains finding mice. Um, and it'll be interesting to see as we do more testing, if these codes change, um, or you know, if any a sort of new resistant strains are added to this, but as more testing uh, comes about, I imagine that picture will um, will show that. And as I mentioned earlier, house mice naturally have a higher tolerance to rodenticides than brown rats across the board, and that is just the amount they are eating uh, on a weight for weight basis. Okay, so this is the active ingredients, similar to that uh, previous um, graph that shows. Uh, the product and its effectiveness against each strain. You can see their warfarin and kumatechanol. Uh, they may work against this strain in, in certain areas, um, but there has been resistance found to diphenicum in the Cambridge strain and then bromodialone in the Reading strain. Now, for both rats and mice, the resistance you can find uh, on the map. And to find this map, you're going to go to the rrac.info webpage. Um, you basically go to the web page, there'll be a map on the screen. You've got to click on the map before it allow you to then search that map. Once you click on the map, you can zoom into a very small area. So you can look at a, a postcode, you can even look at individual streets. Um, so you can go right down, see what testing has been done in your area, and it'll tell you um, how many susceptible rodents were there, how many carrying uh, a resistant strain, and then which resistant strain has been found in that area. So that will give you all the information you need uh, for your areas. If you want another video um, that, that delves a bit deeper into uh, resistance mapping, um, I know Dr. Alan Buckle did a really good forum uh, for us a couple of years ago called uh, 60 Years of Anticoagulant Resistance in the UK. Um, and you can go and watch that. There's a lot more information about the mapping. It will have changed slightly um, over the last couple of years, um, but you know it'll show you where uh, these sort of strains are and how they are overlapping now as well. There are lots of gaps in the mapping um, because the tail samples have come from specific areas or there's places where we've not had many tail samples from. Um, so more sampling does need to be done to give that, um, that map a, a broader picture. Um, but I believe out of all the countries, because the map does cover a lot of Europe as well, uh, I think we've done the most uh, sampling. Um, so we do have a, a sort of a good picture overall. It just needs to have more tail samples to give us a more defined picture of that. Okay, so this is a fairly new sort of um, information piece that was put together. You'll start to see it's popping up everywhere, and it has been over the sort of last 18 months. Um, and it basically lists the anticoagulants, and then it's put them into subgroups. So first generation anticoagulants, second generation multi-feeds, and second generation single feeds. Um, and then it'll tell you what they're useful against. So FGARs for use against uh, Norway rats with no resistance to anticoagulants. The multi-feeds, bromodialone, diphenicum for use against Norway rats, there is no resistance to anticoagulants, and also against strains uh, 128Q and 139S. And then the single feeds for use against all house mice and all strains of rats. Now, recommended for control of all strains is a colicalciferol, um, and then you've got narcotics such as alpha-chlorolose, 
um, and it's recommended for all strains of house mice. On the bottom there, you've got gases, um, and these are done by specifically trained personnel only. Um, so you need to carry out the training to be able to use them gassing compounds. Okay, so tail sampling then. So to get a better picture of the resistance situation, we need to do tail sampling. Um, it's quite simple to do. You just need a, a, a rodent that's died quite recently, sort of within the last 24 hours. You remove two to three centimeters of the ta tail and place it in one of the kits that you can have sent out to you. Um, you then need to freeze that tail within four hours. Once you've froze it, you need to organize it, get it to a lab. The sooner you get it to the lab, the better, um, because they'll then store it properly um, in, in a lot lower temperatures, and then they'll be able to extract the DNA. Um, that would be the ideal way that uh, if you're doing tail sampling, um, you know, to send your tails in. You can take the tail sample, that two to three centimeters, put it in the kit and send it straight away in the post. It is just less likely that the DNA will be able to be extracted from that tail once it's got down to uh, APAH, um, who are now doing the, the testing on this. Uh, this isn't just for the pest control industry. So gamekeepers and farmers are also encouraged to send in these tail samples. Um, and this should link up the dots, especially um, with like farmers, if there's a, a broad area um, where there's not much sampling, they could fill in them dots for that area as well. Um, you can collect multiple tails at a time, uh, but the important thing is getting them down to APAH in a timely uh, manner. So if you've got like one site and you've got a few different tail samples, you can collect them all, um, just use the kits provided. It tells you in the kit what to do with it um, and then send them in in one go if you want to, um, but just make sure that you're following the instructions on there. Now it is a fairly expensive process. Um, so normally the tails are stored together until they have enough tails so they can carry out testing on say a machine load. So they'll store a few tails up, wait till they've got a machine load, then run the machine in one, in one hit and, and do all the testing in one go. Um, obviously the more samples that get sent in, I imagine the more often these uh, tests can be run, the quicker the results will be published. And obviously the more information that's gonna be available for us as well. I do know that some of the tail sampling has taken slightly longer. Um, and I think that is the reason. Uh, I spoke to a few people that have done it um, and said they're not having the results back for a, a few days. Um, and that's probably the reason why they're probably just storing them up until they've got enough to run a machine load of them. And it's recently changed from Reading University to APHA. Um, so I imagine they're sorting out their sort of communications and things backwards and forwards, which could be another reason. Uh, if you would like any more information on tail sampling, um, you just go to the Think Wildlife uh, website and I'll show you that in a second. And you can order your kits from there. They do need more samples from areas like Cumbria, Cumbria um, Northumberland, Northumberland, Lancashire, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, Leicester, Warwickshire, Hertfordshire, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Bedfordshire. And I think pretty much the whole of Scotland. Um, uh, so anywhere in Scotland uh, will uh, benefit from tail sampling as well. So there's lots of areas that they still need data from. Um, I know there was one particular area, sort of North uh, Wales border area, um, and then around there, it's been pretty sparse on tail sampling. So if there's, if you look on the map and there's no sampling done in your area, um, it would be helpful to try and fill in them blank spots. And it gives us a better picture on how this, um, how these mutations are actually spreading across the country. So. By doing this tail sampling, we can see where these uh, mutations are meeting um, and we can uh, you know, get a better picture of where it's all moving around. Uh, this is a thinkwildlife.org website. Um, when you go on, there is a big banner on the homepage that says stop the spread of resistance, request your kit, kit here. If you just click on that banner, it will take you to a web page where you can fill out your details um, and order a kit. Uh, just be mindful, it is quite expensive. It is a free to use service um so if you are ordering a kit uh, please make sure you are using them um it comes with all the information in the kit you just need to put the tail in and follow the instructions and then post it off uh, to the testing place okay so how does tail sampling work when they first started doing this uh, testing they actually required a live animal um they would do the test uh, from the animal, and then it would give them the result. Uh, nowadays, it has been um, 
streamlined by a group of uh, researchers in Germany, and they've been able to identify it through this DNA sampling. Um, this obviously made the process a lot easier. Uh, it means that a wider audience can get involved. It also makes it possible for like pest controllers to be able to take and tail samples um, and send them in to, to make that map uh, a bit more accurate. Um, there's another important factor with DNA as well. Uh, it comes from two parents. So you see this DNA helix. There are two uh, strands that wind around. One is from one parent um, and one is from uh, the other parent. When you have resistant mutation in one parent, this is um, heterozygous. And when you have resistant strains in both parents, uh, that's homozygous. Now, what they've discovered uh, in some areas, and I think it was first found in Scotland, um, where both parents were carrying a resistant mutation, but each parent was carrying a different strain. So they found the L128Q strain, which is what you'd expect to find in Scotland, but they also found um, the sort of very resistant Hampshire strain, the L120Q, um, also in them rats in Scotland. Um, so they are getting this. It's only been in the last couple of years that this has been found, but they are getting this, um, these colonies of rodents where they have two different strains uh, of mutations within the DNA. Okay. So what does resist resistance look like? These are sort of hypothetical situations um, just to show you how it sort of comes about um, and what to be uh, vigilant for when you are carrying out your rodenticide treatment. So this is a colony of rodents. Uh, you can see here on the left, some uh, uh, green trials triangles, they would be the susceptible ones. You have then got orange arrows. Um, these would have a... Uh, single parent that would carry the mutation and then one susceptible parent. And then you have the red squares where both parents uh, would be found to carry a mutation uh, in the DNA. So let's say you go onto this site and you use FGARS to start your treatment. Um, this would wipe out the population of susceptible ones. So all the triangles would disappear, uh, but leaving um, the two resistant strains there. Now you go back um, and you change the product because you notice this level of resistance. So you start using a multi-feed uh, rodenticide. You're then going to wipe out the ones uh, that are carrying, let's say, the L28Q Scotland strain um, because they would be susceptible to them um, multi-feed products. This would then leave the most resistant strain, which for this instance would be the Hampshire strain because um, they would show levels of resistance towards them second generation multi-feeds. Um, so you'd have to use, obviously, then single feeds to control uh, them resistant ones. Now, if you don't recognize this and you only control, let's say, 70% of the population there, um, you are then going to leave just this super resistant strain in that area. Now, when these then breed, instead of it being 70% susceptible, say, it may go the other way where it's now 75% of the population is then resistant. So just by leaving these last few rodents and not dealing with a whole problem um, while you're on that site could mean that the, the next time these repopulate um, and have been breeding, you have a more resistant strain in that area. So what would that look like in terms of bait take? So green is your sort of optimum, as it were. Um, you start off your treatment, you put your rodenticide down, they start to eat it, so you have this high level of bait take. And then as the days go on, this bait take will decrease. And hopefully before day 35, um, you will have no more uh, active rodents in that area. So you'll see no more bait take. If you have resistance, um, it's going to look a bit more like the red line where the susceptible ones have been controlled um, in the first couple of weeks. But then you will see a low level of bait take where the resistant strains are still feeding on the rodenticide and it's not actually affecting them. So that low level of bait take will continue. Um, and that's how you would uh, see resistance while you're on that particular site. Okay, so dealing with resistance, then what can we do? Understanding your location is a big part of this. Um, the mapping is really helpful. Uh, so if you can, if you go and have a look at the map, it will show you what resistance strains have been found in your areas, and also carry helping with that tail sampling. Um, if you can help with the tail sampling, it will highlight you know, your area better as to what resistant has been found. 
Changing the active ingredient uh, will help. So don't use a product you know you've got resistance to. Um, you're basically just going to be feeding them. It is bad practice and it's just going to promote resistance in that area. They're just going to keep feeding off it um, and it's not going to help the situation. So change the active ingredient to one that will work in your area. Uh, and that is going to obviously save you time and money um, and it's going to stop the spread of this resistance as well. Uh, don't forget there's no genetic resistance to breakback traps or glue boards. So physical methods of control um, you can still use. I know glue boards uh, are currently going through a, a slight change um, and we'll see what that looks like at the end of that. Uh, but physical methods of control are your way forward when dealing with physiological resistance. Okay, behavior resistance then. So there's three main ones I'm going to talk about today. You've got near phobia. So brown rats commonly have near phobia and they'll have it in different levels. Uh, so let's take a city center rat um, may have a lower level of near phobia maybe compared to someone that's lived out in the field and you know never seen a person or a bait box before. So you will get different levels of near phobia um, in different populations of rats. And it can take a number of days to overcome this. Uh, you know, it could take up to two weeks for them to be acceptant of, of a new product, in a, a new object in that area. Um, so let's say you're setting up a site, for instance, for an external rodent treatment. If you don't see activity in them boxes for the first couple of weeks and you start to see activity building, it may be that them uh, rats on that site uh, have been, um, you know, they've showed signs of near phobia to, to them boxes uh, and have avoided using them up until that point. And this is a good indication of near phobia if you are dealing with an external rodent issue. Um, the other one that we deal with is bait shyness. Now, this is commonly associated with acute poisons like alpha chlorolose. Um, acute basically means fast acting. So normally with alpha chlorolose, it works in a few minutes. Compare that to the chronic rodenticides we have, where it takes sort of three to 10 days for it to take effect. Now, the easiest way to describe bait shyness is, you know, if you go to a um, seafood restaurant, uh, you eat some fish, it makes you feel unwell. Um, you're probably going to avoid eating there again. And it works the same way with acute poisons. Uh, they eat a small amount, they realize they're starting to feel unwell. Uh, that then builds that avoidance of that product in the future. So they'll just avoid eating it um, and shy away from it. And we've also got equipment avoidance. So over the years, I've had, you know, been able to use trail cams and things to be able to film um, rats and mice in properties uh, and actually seeing video evidence of them avoiding traps and bait boxes and things like that. Um, and there's a number of other things that could promote this maybe, you know, this, a scent left on the box, um, human smell, if you've touched something, uh, it could be an attractant. So it may be an attractant that they've decided to avoid um, because, because they know it's something that's been used uh, to attract them before. Um, and I did this with, uh, some traps many years ago when we still use peanut butter um, and we actually filmed some traps and the mice were just going on smelling it and then avoiding it. Um, so you, you can get avoidance to things uh, like that as well. Okay, so I've got a few studies uh, that have been done on behavioral resistance. Um, I can't find the full papers to these, but I'll give you an overview of them. I'm sure the papers are out there somewhere, um, but this is some research that's been done uh, and what they found uh, when doing this research. So this was done on mice in Birmingham, and it's found that mice in Birmingham were preferred to prefer um, protein-based products. Uh, so they'll avoid eating cereal-based products. Now, over time, this has led to some mice having uh, low levels or even um, not having the enzyme in the gut that will digest cereals. So they, once they eat a cereal, they can't digest it. So they'll just avoid eating them all together. Um, so in an area like this, uh, you know, it may be more apparent to use more um, protein-based products, such as pasta tea bags or wax blocks. Um, these will have less cereal content in them than maybe a grain product. Um, and it may be more likely they're going to eat them. Uh, also using high protein based attractants on traps. So years ago when I was working in Birmingham, we used to use a lot of mayonnaise because um, it worked really well as a trap attractant because they were preferring that high protein food source. Okay, Manchester, this was a, another piece of research done. I think it was Gay Murphy um, that did this piece of research. And this was on behavior uh, um, in mice in relation to bait, box, uh, bait boxes and bait trays. So there are three different types of sites. 
Um, and it was spread into six locations. So they'd have like two houses, but in different locations, two factories in different locations. And they attested the amount of food that was eaten from each box. Um, and what they found was that cardboard boxes um, that were slightly higher in size um, had the most take in them. Um, so it was protected. Um, and when they looked into this, uh, they found that um, the cardboard boxes allowed more mice to feed into the box at once. So you'd get them feeding together inside this box and the box was slightly higher. So because of that extra height, when they observed the mice feeding, they would sit on the back legs, hold the grain within the front paws and then eat like that. So they'd use them front paws sat upright. So that's slightly higher box, um, given the ability for multiple mice to feed in the box at one time, but also their natural feeding behavior, they was able to, to, to carry out that behavior um, feeding the food source, feeding on the food source that was there. Now, I think both these studies are very fascinating, um, and it's something to take into account. I know these were done in very specific areas, uh, but if you are coming across uh, your sites where you're having these sort of issues, it may be just trying slightly different size boxes um, or trying different uh, formulations of bait. You know, it may be something that works in that area. Like I say, these were very specific, done in Manchester and Birmingham, um, but like we've seen with uh, physiological resistance, it is possible that this sort of behavior is, is going to be exhibited elsewhere as well. Okay, so what can we do about behavior resistance? Like I said, knowledge is key. Um, recognize a sign of behavior resistance early will give you the best chance for a successful treatment. Um, modern day technology, things like trail cams, uh, do work very well. Um, you can set them up um, and you can actually see the rodents avoiding the, the traps or the, the boxes, as it were. Um, and it'll hopefully give you a bit more information on how to minimize this happening in the future. Don't forget about tracking dust and gels. Um, I know the gels have been on the market for the last couple of years. Uh, again, they'll walk through it. If they're walking round traps and boxes, you will see that um, as they're avoiding them traps and boxes uh, and the footprints um, will obviously uh, show where they are moving. Um, it may be that you're not in the right area and they're going a different route, maybe a different way down the wall, um, or it may be show that they are just avoiding the boxes altogether. Now, there's a lot of research um, that's going into different types of resistance. Uh, so it's really important, obviously, to keep up to date with that. Um, and I say the, the places that I've mentioned today, you can get more information on uh, and keep up to date with that sort of resistance. Um, and there are many variables when it comes to behavioral resistance. So managing it can be quite tricky. Um, it may be things like different types of boxes, um, maybe trying less carbohydrate focused products, such as uh, pasta tea bags and wax blocks will carry less carbohydrate ca carbohydrates um, than um, a cereal. Uh, or a get grain based product. Um, moving traps in different locations, even trying different traps or different trap attractants. I remember years ago, I had a rat uh, job um, and we couldn't get it to go on breakback traps. So we switched to fen traps and that seemed to work. Um, so trying different trap designs maybe could also be uh, something to look at. And don't forget your contact products. So you've got um, contact rodenticides, gels and foams now. Um, they don't need to uh, sit and feed on these directly um, they will consume them um, when they are grooming so they'll pick them up on the fur uh, and consume them at a later date as they're spending their time grooming don't forget rodents will spend 20 percent of their day grooming um, so it, or a little bit over 20 percent of their day grooming so they do spend a lot of time uh, carrying out that behavior um, and rodents may have a different preference to food so you know food products um, so finding what they're eating on that site, that's what they're going to prefer. Uh, and we used to use a lot of this when we was looking for like trap attractants for a certain site. Um, you'd be able to, to find out what they're eating on site uh, and use that to your advantage in your traps. Um, and don't forget to look at the local environment. I remember a few years ago, we had a particularly uh, difficult site. It was a big warehouse that had a, a mouse infestation for a very long time. Um, and we had to sit and observe the rats. Uh, with cameras and we found the rats were basically, uh, sorry, the mice were basically moving from one pallet to another. So they'd be in one pallet, they'd run across the next pallet and then they'd spend time underneath that pallet looking for either food that's fallen out um, or seeing what's in that area. Uh, now we couldn't get them on anything. We tried lots of different uh, techniques and attractants, but what we actually found did work was that we made some um, pallets that we put traps inside, fixed the traps inside and then made like a, a barrier around the outside of them. So it was like a pallet turned into a bait box. Um, and that worked really well. 
uh, with the mice going in there, spending time in that pallet, they get caught on the trap. And we just put them dummy pallets underneath the actual pallets of food. Uh, so that works quite well. So the environment, look at what they're using in their, in their environment and use that uh, to your advantage. Okay. Um, good. Oh, just one more thing. I just thought about while I was on that. Um, we did have a site in London uh, quite maybe five or six years ago. Um, and that we had the same formulation of product um, from the same manufacturer, but with two different active ingredients. And when we was on that site, we actually found that they would eat one active ingredient, but wouldn't eat the other active ingredient. Um, and I couldn't find any research that's done on it. Um, and I imagine someone will look into it at some point. Um, but they'd actually, they would consume one active ingredient, but not the other. And it was on the same formulation of products. That was a, an interesting, uh, an interesting site that we had. Cool. Any questions? I'll just stop sharing this. Okay. Uh, with new products such as Celentra, uh, do you feel this could help overcome genetic resistance? Um, yeah, so new products have been de developed. A lot of the active ingredients, um, you know, like conicalciferols and things like that have been around for a long time. Um, it's just that we've not used them um, for a while and then they've come back to market. Um, that yeah, they, they could be more, more effective. You saw on that graph where they had conicalciferols on there um, uh, and it was, uh, you know, there's no resistance to it as it were um across the strains um okay Cerexa d bait has always been eaten by house mice it's only active ingredient is diphenicum resistance in buildings can someone else use the same seed but with bradyphacum or diethylone um so actually i'm not sure if that's a manufacturing thing where they make sorexa with a different active ingredient uh that would be down to the manufacturers if they bring that to market um uh if you go on a site and you find resistance so uh, i think good practice is use one product uh, on a site if you find you've got resistance to that one product you just remove it all and then put something else down um i've seen over the years where people have had like different products in different areas um but uh, yeah i don't know if uh uh I, I, don't, I don't think it's good practice i think use one product across the whole site and um, if you find you've got resistance to it take it all out and then switch it to something else just make sure with all this product information that you're following the product labels uh that is um, obviously the important thing when it comes to product selection on a site okay Uh, will there be any resistance mapping or further testing of resistance of Rattus ratus? Um, not sure, probably because it's only uh, in certain areas, especially in this country, um, possibly in Europe, they may have more of a problem with this, um, but I don't know of any testing that's been done on Rattus ratus in this country as of yet. Okay. Uh, can someone make cardboard trays? Possibly. Um, speak to your manufacturing and distributors, see what they can come up with. Uh, there are lots of things out there that, um, you know, we, we sometimes get a little bit um, uh, tunnel vision where we have, you know, one system that works great for us um, uh, and we, you know, you don't see other things that are coming out to market. There are lots of things out there. Um, you know, I went out to a site last week um, and they were using traps that I'd never seen before um, and they were quite a good design. So, uh, yeah, th this is why things like PPC Live um, are really good to get involved with because you can go and have a look at the shows and things, but they do have a lot of products there that, um, you know, you might not have seen before um, and you can get a bit of information why you're there as well. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good way to go. Um, how are you able to know if rodenticides are really cereal based or protein based? Um, good question. I imagine most of the information will be in the material safety data sheet um, as to what's in it. Um, I just through the years of um, sort of looking at these research papers and things, I just picked up bits that um, are sort of stuck with me. Uh, but yeah, um, probably material safety data sheets for that one. Uh, 
near phobia is an increasing problem. Is that correct? Why is that? Um, I don't know if it's an increasing problem. I think it's we've always had the problem. Um, it may be that if uh, rodents are in a particular area and not being disturbed, let's say a drainage system, and then they are coming out of that drainage system because there is a break somewhere, um, it may be that they're just showing signs in that area because that population's moved there. Um, not sure it's an increasing problem or not, uh, but it is definitely a problem that I've seen in lots of different places. Uh, are there any new technologies for rodent control you recommend? There's lots of new technologies about. Um, not sure of any I would recommend that I'd definitely say use this. It will you know, change what you do. Um, but there are definitely lots of new technologies about. I quite liked when we had the trail cams. They were really useful, especially on um, problem sites. Uh, they did help quite a lot. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's lots of new technology out there. Uh, finding what fit and works for you is probably going to be the best way to go. Uh, resistance like in the Southwest, I'm assuming that's Southwest England. Um, <clears throat> so all along that sort of Hampshire central belt from, you know, London across, there's been quite a lot of testing done there because um, the... Uh, Research was done at Reading University, um, and they did a lot of sample testing from around that area. Um, so the resistance uh, is particularly bad along there, especially that Hampshire strain. Um, it is the most resistant uh, strain we have, as we saw on that graph. Um, so yeah, uh, look on the mapping for specific areas um, on the rrac.info uh, webpage. Like I say, click on the map, and it will allow you to then look around it um, but you've got to click on the map first before you can actually move it around. Uh, yeah, so is there any research done on resistance in the environment outside the UK? There is. I can't remember how big the resistance map is um, that is on the RRAC uh, webpage, uh, the Rodenticide Resistance Action Committee um, webpage, uh, but there is a lot of testing done in a lot of other countries and there is more happening um you know as resistance uh, testing becomes more and more we are getting a better picture across the board uh, and there's a lot of research done in france um, and i know there's a bit of research done in germany especially looking into sort of dna sampling and things like that okay um Uh, can you tell me why warfarin isn't being taken off the market? Um, as it's oh, why it has been taken off the market? Uh, not sure. I imagine um, it was down to uh, probably the amount it was being used. It's probably not being used very much, so it's probably just been removed for that reason. Um, that's normally um, if products disappear, either that or they change the legislation behind it. Uh, but I'm not sure why warfarin was removed. Okay, I'll find a couple more in here. Um, any other trap attractant, uh, any other trap attractant recommendations that actually work? Um, yeah, peanut butter and chocolate were like the go-to um, when I started pest control 13 or 14 years ago. Uh, that has changed somewhat. There are lots of manufactured attractants out there um, with attractants it's what works in your area so um trying to uh you know work out what works in your area um it's a bit of trial and error sometimes with attractants uh but that will help you select in the future you know i, I can go to this because i know it has worked before um and there'll be things that you'll just avoid um as it, we we stopped using peanut butter just because of the allergy reasons um and a lot of the sites that i used to look after were like big food manufacturing um, and they didn't allow peanuts or any kind of nuts on site anyway. Uh, so that kind of stopped that one um, back then. Uh, but look what they're eating on site. I've been to sites before where they've been eating a certain brand of crisp because the package is already damaged. I've just said to the site, am I right to use some of these? The trap attractant, they're only going to throw it in the bin. Normally they're quite all right with um, with allowing you to do that. 
Um, do tail samples have to be from trap rodents or are ones that have ingested bait acceptable? Um, I imagine both. They're not actually testing the rodents. They're just testing the DNA. Um, so they're going to take the DNA out of that tail uh, and they'll find the markers within that DNA, which will show um, whether it is susceptible or not um, and which strain. So they can see which strain from that DNA um, when they do the testing. Um, so tail samples, like I say, there is a lot more information on tail sampling uh, on the website. You can order the kits um, and they do have, uh, you know, a what to do guide in there as well. Um, and that what to do guide will, will show you how to go on um, with that tail sampling um, and the best practice for it. Okay, good stuff. I think that's all the questions. Uh, it was great to see you all here today. Um, I will be back uh, next month in November with a proofing strategies um, webinar, and I hope to see you all there. Have a great rest of your day.